you may be seated. Um, I did have a few people after the first service come and show me that they didn't have socks on. So just be ready for your socks to be knocked off this morning by the Holy Spirit. Oh my goodness, I want Lucas's energy, I think. <laughs> Love it. But I am coming to you today on a, on a mountaintop, on a mountain high, because we just yesterday afternoon got back home from Lake Okoboji. Do any of you know where Lake Okoboji is? Yes, some fellow Iowans, right? It's very northern Iowa, and it is a beautiful place. And this is the ninth time, actually, that uh, we've spent a week there for family Bible camp. So we go to Okoboji Lutheran Bible Camp every summer, and the kids can't wait to get back the next summer. And so uh, they asked me last summer um, if I would be, one of, it would be the speaker for this past week. And so I said yes, and the director sent me, I love how God works in all of these details, the director sent me the information for their theme and for the scripture they were going to be using. So I've got my camp shirt on this morning, um, and it's Philippians 3. And uh, that morning that I received that email, I was working on a sermon to preach here. Can you guess what text I was using? Philippians 3. I'm like, all right, yeah, God's at work. And then they send me the logo, and here it is. This is Iowa. It's not entirely flat. There's hills, right? But there are not mountains. Here's the theme picture logo for, for the week. Does this look like Long's Peak? <laughs> like, this looks like our view from church. I'm like, all right, God, bring the mountain girl out to Iowa. We can talk about some mountaintops and some storms um, and life in the valley. And so uh, it's just awesome to see how God works. And so we got there last week, um, and we get out of the car, and we go to the registration table, and I turn around, and I see this familiar face. Do you ever see someone out of context, and you're like, wait, I know you, but I don't know you from here well, it turned out that it was David and Renee McDaniels, who worshiped for quite a while with us. Um, they have three grandkids who they've adopted as their kids, and so they call them mom and dad. Um, and they were there for camp. They had friends who were trying to get them to camp for several years now, um, and they had heard that I was speaking. They, so they worshiped with us. They moved to Strasburg. They continued to worship here even when they lived in Strasburg, but then moved to Iowa. And so now they're in Iowa. So these Iowa friends had been trying to get them to camp. Um, and when they heard that I was going to be there, we're like, we decided that that was the week we were going to go. And so there they are. Um, it's just cool how God does that. And while they were here, was blessed to be able to baptize um, the three kids. And so one of the nights at camp, we do a, a worship service that involves communion. And so families come up together to commune. And so they came up to commune, and, and we communed together. Uh, and it was the kids' first communion. And so they said, how cool is that, that the pastor that baptized us in Colorado then is part of our first communion in Iowa? Only God can do those kinds of things, right? So cool to see him at work. And this was the first time that all five of us were able to go. Steve hasn't been able to go in previous years, so all of us were able to go. And our girls both took friends as well. And so, uh, so we had five teenagers with us this week. Talk about an adventure. Oh, my goodness. Um, just absolutely awesome. Um, but I was out of my comfort zone, too. And so they asked me if I would be the speaker. And I said, absolutely. Um, and then you're like, oh, my gosh, what did I agree to? <laughs> So fun. Had a couple hours every day together with the adults, um, diving into this theme of Philippians uh, 3 and talking about mountaintops and valleys and storms and all of those things in between. Um, and God worked in some really cool ways. The way the Holy Spirit speaks is just absolutely amazing. So Okoboji is gorgeous. It's a huge lake. You wouldn't expect that, but it is a huge lake. I think it, the deepest point is 136 feet. So it's a pretty big lake, um, and it's beautiful. And they've built with these huge stones this amphitheater that looks out on the lake. And so we'd have campfires at night sitting on these huge stones and looking out onto the lake. And then these five teenagers decided it'd be pretty cool to get up for sunrise and go watch the sunrise. And so they got up at 5.30 and trekked down to the lake and watched the sunrise. And they came back, and they were like, that was pretty cool. But actually, we want to go at first light. So then they got up at 5 in the morning to go down to be at the lake uh, for first light. That is miraculous, people. <laughs> Five teenagers getting up at 5 in the morning. And they actually ended up doing that twice because they were like, 
wow, it is so cool to see God raising the sun up and the way it's over the water. And I mean, they just were like, blah, 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 about this experience of experiencing God as they look out on the water as the sun is coming up. And so we were around water all week, uh, swimming and canoeing and tubing and those campfires looking out over the water. And so kept thinking and praying about this passage that we're in today as Jesus' disciples are out on this water. And so we're going to be talking about the story this morning uh, of this lake that they're on. There's a story about a preacher who was doing baptisms in a lake, and as he's doing these baptisms, this drunk man wanders up into it, and he kind of goes out in the water. And so the preacher sees him, and he says, are you ready to find Jesus? And the drunk man's like, yeah, preacher, I sure am. And so he puts him down under the water, and he brings him back up, and he's like, well, did you find Jesus? And the drunk man's like, no, I didn't find him. And so the preacher's like, all right. So he dunks him down under the water again, and he brings him up. And he's like, OK, brother, this time did you find Jesus? And the drunk man's like, I didn't find him. And so uh, the preacher takes him one more time, and he puts him under the water, and he holds him there kind of for a little bit. Uh, and brings him back up, and he, as he brings him back up, he's taking you know, this big gulp of air and wiping his eyes out. And, and he said, well, did you find Jesus? And he said, no, preacher, I didn't. Are you sure this is where he fell in? <laughs> well, today's story, what freaks the disciples out is that Jesus didn't fall in the water, that he's on the water, that Jesus has power even over the water that he doesn't fall in, that we don't find him under the water, we find him on the water. So let's open our Bibles to John 6, and we'll have uh, the verses up on the screen too, if you'd prefer to do that, that's fine. Um, this is one of the miracles that we find uh, about Jesus in, in the Gospel of John. And so as we come to chapter 6, uh, I want to back up just a little bit. This passage begins at verse 16, but I want to back up uh, for a minute here to verse 15, because what verse 15 says, it's on page 1531 in the Quest Bibles, um, or up on the screen here. Uh, Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. And so this, uh, he, Jesus is with these people, um, and they have been waiting for a Messiah. And so as they see Jesus then, they want to make him king. He has physically provided for them. They would love for him to become king and take over the Roman Empire that was so oppressive. And so Jesus knows that they want to force him to become king. And so he slips away, and he's, in the other Gospels we see he actually sends his disciples out uh, to cross the water. And so uh, we know when Jesus sends us out, when he calls us, um, that oftentimes that journey can be challenging. It can be challenging physically, it can be challenging spiritually, it can be challenging mentally, and often in those times these storms come up. And so one of the things we learn uh, in this passage that we're in today is that storms will come. That often as Christians, for some reason, we think we get some little exempt card, right? Oh no, storm? Nope, I'm a Christian, right? Storms don't come to Christians. Life should be smooth and good all the time. Notice here too, the disciples are actually doing what Jesus has told them to do. So they're being obedient. Like with Jonah, he's disobedient, isn't he? But here they're being obedient and still a storm comes. And so let's look at this. Um, it was interesting this week to be out at the lake um, and to see how fast storms can come up and how quickly that water can change. Um, uh, this camp is located in a state park. It's Gold Point State Park. And so if you go out on a canoe, you can kind of go around, follow the shore a little bit, and then hit an inlet. And you can go back through all these canals through this state park where there's these gorgeous trees and there's often turtles and lots of birds and it's just super pretty back in there. And then if you come out on the other side there and come back onto the lake, uh, Steve and Joshua and I did this Friday morning together, and so it was super quiet, and really the water was really smooth as we went back into the canals. 
As we started coming out on the other side, the wind had changed and was starting to pick up. And so those waves were starting to rock pretty good. Those storms on the water can come up pretty quick. And those waves can be very big waves. One afternoon, we went um, out on the tube, like a banana boat tube. Um, and we love our driver. He's there every year. And so he does a great job all the time um, on our time on the lake with him. Uh, and so, but the wind had come up that day, too. And so Abby's in the front. Um, and we hit this wave. Oh, my goodness. She went like, woo! He is like, I have never seen someone take so much air. <laughs> but that wave, right? And often from shore, those waves don't look like they're a big deal. But when you're out in a boat, those waves can get pretty big. And they can even come over the sides into the boat, can't they? So, uh, so as we're here in this story, let's look at, at verses 16 and 17. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake, where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark, and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing, and the waters grew rough. And now it was dark. Our storms often feel worse at night, don't they? And so darkness is coming with these disciples. Um, and I'm sure the storm felt more dangerous, and they were more uncomfortable. Heard a preacher once say, don't doubt in the dark what you heard in the light. Because what you heard in the light is also true in the dark. Don't doubt in the darkness what you heard in the light. And so John here is the one who mentions this. Um, and they've been waiting for their master to appear. Uh, and there sounds like in this verse, doesn't it, that there's some disappointment there, that they've been waiting for him, that maybe even despair is starting to set in at this point with this wind blowing hard and this darkness coming around. Uh, this water that they're on is in a perfect place for a storm. It's at about 700 feet below sea level, and then the mountains around it go up a couple thousand feet. And so that wind can just tear off those mountains and quickly cause these storms to come about. We learn from the other Gospels that they are a long distance from the land, that they are out in the middle of the sea, that they're being battered by waves, and that they are straining at the oars. And they are making painful progress. So they had left sometime between 6 and 9 at night. And then as we come to this part in the story, we learn that it is the fourth watch of the night. And so it's between 3 and 6 in the morning. Several hours, isn't it, that have elapsed since they set off. And so they are probably exhausted from rowing through this. And how far had they gone? Look at those verses. What does it say? Verse 19. Three, three and a half miles. So maybe halfway-ish across after all of those hours. And so they must have been tired at this point, maybe even bordering on despair at this point. And how often are we like the disciples that we have short memories and weak faith, short memories and weak faith. Because look, just before this passage, what's the story right before this passage? At the end of chapter, or the beginning before we get to this, the beginning of um, chapter 6, what's the story? Jesus feeding the 5,000. I heard Dylan did an awesome job on that last weekend. I'm excited to be able to watch uh, the video and to hear that um, as he explained this miracle that Jesus did, that he took how much? Two fish, how many loaves of bread? And fed how many people? More than 5,000, probably 20,000. I think Dylan talked about that um, last week, probably somewhat the size of Louisville. Um, and so they had, this is just hours before they're on the boat. I mean, we're talking hours. Jesus did this miracle, this stunning miracle. And so we're only a few hours later here. And here they are in the middle of the lake with rough waters being tied from rowing. And they're like, and, and Jesus hadn't yet appeared. But then let's look at verse 19. When they had rowed three or three and a half miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat walking on the water, walking on the water, and they were terrified. 
We would like to think, I'm sure, that if we were in their situation, we would have pointed to Jesus and been like, hey, it's Jesus. And yet we see as he comes across the lake walking on the water that they're terrified. How often have we found ourselves rowing and rowing and rowing in the middle of a storm, worrying about those winds and waves and that we've forgotten something amazing that God has just done in our lives. And so these disciples, even on the heels of this miraculous feeding, when they see Jesus coming out on the water, are terrified. And most of these disciples, many of these disciples, I guess I should say, are fishermen. So storms aren't something new for them. They've experienced that before. But they had never experienced a man walking on water. And so as they see Jesus walking to them, they're frightened. And yet we know storms are going to come. And yet God uses those storms in our lives as well. There's, uh, it's the one bird people... The albatross is a pretty cool bird. It's got a really big wingspan, and they will actually spend 18 months at sea, um, and all of their landings then are on the water. But they have to come back to lay their eggs on land. And so people say after those 18 months on water, watching them come in and land, they look like drunken sailors. So they don't have their land, their land feet under them, and they actually call them goonie birds because they look so silly coming in trying to land on land. But they've got an 11-foot wingspan, and they actually need stormy currents to carry them. So when things are calm, they aren't able to get up into the air. Those storms are going to come for us, and God works through those storms in our lives. Someone said, I eagerly expect and hope that God will enable me to ride the turbulence and learn the currents of grace that he shows us his grace even in the midst of the storms. And it is in those storms that we can learn about who Jesus is. And so as we talk about portraits of Christ through this series, here we learn more about who Jesus is. As Jesus walks on that water to them, the disciples recognize him. Their faith is strengthened in him. Jesus comes to them in power. And he shows them the power of his presence. Verse 17, it was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. In verse 18, the the sea becomes rough, and it's blowing. But then if we look at verse 20, um, Jesus comes to them, he says, but he said to them, it is I, don't be afraid. And that can actually be translated, I am. Does that sound familiar? They would know immediately who it was, wouldn't they? Jesus says, I am. And he offers them this power of his presence. Verse 21, then they were willing to take him into the boat. And immediately the boat reached the shore where, he, where they were heading. Have you ever experienced the power of the presence of God? And how powerful his presence can be? I can hardly believe it that it's been this many years, but in 2008, my dad was the same age that his dad was when he had a heart attack and died. And so my dad was really afraid of that, that he would die that same way and he would die young. And so he went to the doctor and had a whole battery of tests done, um, and especially his heart, check out how things were, um, and everything came back great, A+. But he started not feeling good, and he he felt something in his chest, like in the center of his chest. And so finally, the doctor ended up sending him for an endoscopy. And I was able to take him that day, and so he had the procedure done. And then the doctor said, we need you to stick around, and I'll meet with you in a few minutes here. And so he comes in, and he said, so we have to wait for the tests, but I am almost 100% sure that this is esophageal cancer. So that was on a Friday, and then Saturday came, and Dad wasn't doing very good, and he wasn't feeling very well, and we have some awesome friends who are both doctors. And so they stopped by, and he said, he's, this isn't, he's not doing well. We need to take him to the ER, and I will go with you. And so he came with us um, to the ER, and as they checked him out, and they did further tests, did a CT scan, then our doctor friend is there able to help us kind of walk through what's going on. And what they found was the cancer had spread throughout his body. Hadn't yet reached his brain, but it was everywhere else. 
And so they admitted him to the hospital. Uh, and as we continued to talk to the doctors and, and try to figure out what was going on, um, they found that there wasn't anything that they could do for him medically, that there wasn't any, any treatment that they can offer. So we decided that we would bring dad to our house um, through hospice, we put a hospital bed in our family room. My whole family moved into our house as well. Um, Dad was hyper social, like loved people, and really was afraid to be alone. And so we made sure there was someone with him all the time, and we took turns every night sleeping on the couch next to him if there was anything he knew. Um, we've got great like two-story in our family room, and we put artwork up on the, that the kids and other people cards sent and all that kind of stuff up on the wall next to him uh, and, and spent that time with him. And it was only about 12 days from diagnosis to death. So on his last morning, uh, my sister was deciding whether or not she should go to work, and her employer really wanted her to be there, so she went ahead and went. And our doctor friends stopped by again, and they said, you need to call Cindy and tell her to come home. And so we did, and Cindy came home, and then my parents' pastor from Boulder at Mount Calvary stopped by, and we spent some time talking, and then we kind of gathered around his bed and held his hand, and we all had held hands around his bed, and we prayed. And then we closed out that time of prayer by all praying the Lord's Prayer together. And when we said amen, Dad took his last breath. And we all stood there, kind of stunned, because the power of the presence of Jesus in that moment was so strong. Jesus' presence in that moment was so strong that we could hardly move or talk in that moment because we felt his presence so strongly. In the midst of that storm, Jesus revealed his power to us, the power of his presence. And so Jesus comes to the disciples in the midst of the storm, and he shows them his power through his presence. We see here as he comes to them and he says, I am, it is I, don't be afraid. And he steps into the boat uh, that this miracle happens to of them just making it to their destination then, how Jesus guides us through those storms. But in that moment when he steps into the boat um, in, in verses 21 there, um, as he steps into the boat, let me turn my page here. Um, then they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. And so he steps on board, and there's this peace. And so we see the power of Jesus as well in this peace that he offers. Um, we had such an awesome night at camp one night this week. Um, they assign a counselor to each family, and so they hang out with us. They become part of our family for the week, and we eat together, and we do devotions together, and we play together. Um, and it was late one night, and Steve had brought his guitar, and so we were sitting out on our deck that looks at the lake um, and singing. And so Steve started playing and singing Holy, 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 and all of us were, were singing, and we're with our counselor, and he's from Sweden, so he's studying theology in Sweden. And so as we start singing in English, this holy, 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 he begins singing it in Swedish. Oh my goodness. The peace of Jesus in that moment was powerful. And so as Jesus comes to his disciples here, he shows not only the power of his presence, but this peace that he offers as well. So we can invite Jesus into our boats, and we can look for him on the water. And in a few weeks here, as we get to John 16, here's a verse from there. I have told you these things, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. That in our storms that will come, Jesus reveals to us who he is, and that he is powerful and that he shows that in his presence and in the peace that he gives. Let's pray. God, you are amazing in the ways that you work, um, in the ways that you weave stories together, and in the way that you invite us to be a part of your story. And so uh, we just thank you for uh, this story of Jesus walking on the, re uh, in the water, a reminder that storms will come, and yet you offer us your presence and you offer us peace 
uh, that passes all understanding. And so uh, we just pray that you would continue to step into our boat, that you would continue to help us to see you in the storm, that you would reveal your presence uh, and the power of your presence and, and that peace that you would continue to give us. May others see that as well. And may that light shine out from that, that they would recognize uh, that you are God and the great I am. And so we pray that you would just work through us this week and whatever storms we're going through, that, that we would experience your presence and your peace. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.